This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 18. Coming up on Space Time. Neutron stars confirmed as the source of ultraluminous X-rays. An interesting twist in the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy. And little prospect of life on Proxima B. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have confirmed neutron stars as one of the sources of ultraluminous X-rays, powerful beams shining with the light of a million suns. The findings reported in the journal Nature Astronomy has gone some way to solving this galactic mystery. Ultraluminous X-rays, or ULXs, were first detected in the 1980s, shining as bright as supermassive black holes. Problem is, they were detected in the outer portions of galaxies, rather than in the galactic core, where supermassive black holes reside. So at first, researchers thought these ultraluminous X-ray sources might be extra-large stellar-mass black holes. But observations in 2014, using numerous telescopes, including NASA's New Star X-ray Space Observatory, found that at least some of these ultraluminous X-ray sources were being produced by neutron stars. Neutron stars are the super-dense stellar corpses of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have gone supernova at the end of their lives, exploding with enough energy to briefly outshine an entire galaxy. Left behind is a stellar corpse, just 25 kilometres wide, in which the progenitor star's mass has been crushed so tightly that positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons are forced together, forming neutrons, hence the name of the star. Three such ultraluminous X-ray sources were identified as being neutron stars. Now, astronomers using NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory has identified a fourth ultraluminous X-ray source as also originating from a neutron star. And the authors also found some new clues about why these objects are shining so brightly. Neutron stars are incredibly dense objects. In fact, just a teaspoonful of neutron star matter would weigh about a billion tons, as much as a mountain. Their immense gravity pulls surrounding material from companion stars onto them, and as this material is dragged on, it heats up, glowing in X-rays. But as a neutron star feeds on matter, there comes a time when so much X-ray radiation is being emitted from the neutron star that it starts pushing away the material it's trying to feed on. Astronomers call this point, when the objects can't accumulate matter any faster and give off more X-rays, the Eddington limit. The study's lead author, Murray Brightman, from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, says there are limits as to how fast neutron stars can accrete matter. But ultraluminous X-ray sources are somehow breaking this X-ray limit, giving off incredibly bright X-rays, and scientists don't yet fully understand how. Brightman and colleagues examined an ultraluminous X-ray source in Messier 51, or M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, a stunning grand-designed spiral galaxy located about 28 million light-years away. The authors analysed archival X-ray data taken by Chandra and discovered an unusual dip in the ultraluminous X-ray source light spectrum. After ruling out other possibilities, they figured out that the dip was from a phenomenon known as cyclotron resonance scattering. That occurs when charged particles, either positively charged protons or negatively charged electrons, circle around a magnetic field. Now, black holes don't have magnetic fields, but neutron stars do. So, the discoveries confirmed that this particular ultraluminous X-ray source in M51 had to be a neutron star. Cyclotron resonance scattering creates telltale signatures in the star's spectrum of light. And the presence of these patterns, called cyclotron lines, can provide information about the strength of the star's magnetic field. But only if the cause of the lines, whether it be protons or electrons, is known. And the researchers don't have a detailed enough spectrum of the new ultraluminous X-ray source to say for certain. Now, if the cyclotron lines coming from protons, then these magnetic fields around the neutron star are incredibly strong and may, in fact, be hoping to break the Eddington limit. Such strong magnetic fields could reduce the pressure from an ultraluminous X-ray source's X-rays, the pressure that's normally pushing away the matter and allowing the neutron star to consume more matter than what it typically would be capable of doing, thereby allowing it to shine so extremely brightly in X-rays. On the other hand, if the cyclotron line's coming from circling electrons, then the magnetic field strength around the neutron star wouldn't be exceptionally strong, and thus the field probably isn't the reason why these stars are breaking the Eddington limit. 
To try and resolve this question, the authors now want to acquire more X-ray data on the ultraluminous X-ray source in M51 and also look for other cyclotron lines in other ultraluminous X-ray sources. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study claims some of the stars around our galaxy, previously thought to be remnants of other galaxies that have been cannibalised by the Milky Way, are instead more likely to have once been part of the Milky Way itself before being pulled away by other galaxies. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, show how the gravitational tidal forces interacting between galaxies as they pass close to each other work both ways, resulting in the creation of tidal streams of stars. The Milky Way is a fairly average barred spiral galaxy, with the majority of its stars circling its centre within the galactic disk. But there's a dusting of stars beyond that, both above and below the plane of the disk, orbiting in what's called the galactic halo. About five years ago, researchers set out to study a set of structures, large over densities of stars which are streaming in partial rings close to the galactic disk. These clusters extend well beyond what's considered to be the edge of the disk and bulge of the galaxy, above and below the halo where the stars normally lie. The streams had been interpreted as signatures of the Milky Way's tumultuous past, debris from numerous small galaxies that are thought to have been cannibalised by the Milky Way and been disrupted by its massive gravitational tidal forces. The first project to measure the speed of stars in the most distant structures, known as the Triangular Andromeda Clouds, about 14,000 light-years above and below the plane of the Milky Way, showed that these stars form coherent sequences in speed as well as in space. Researchers then collected and consolidated data on a second group of closer structures, known as A13 and the Monoceros Ring, to show that they also followed clear sequences in speed and space. That study showed that all of these structures follow the same sequences, suggesting that they could be related to each other, perhaps through the same disruption event. The research team then looked at the composition of stars in these overdensities. While previous studies had looked at old bloated stars known as red giants, which are in the final phase of their lives and are relatively rich in elements heavier than helium, researchers in this study instead proposed expanding the sample range by also collecting speeds for RR Lyra stars, which contain a much smaller fraction of heavy elements. RR Lyra stars are a class of variable red giants which were originally Population 2 stars. Population 2 stars are ancient bodies produced directly out of the material created by the universe's very first stars. They therefore have very low metallicities. Metallicity is simply astronomers speak for any element heavier than hydrogen or helium. These RR Lyra stars have lost much of their mass during their red giant phase, and they're now all less massive than the Sun, making them hard to find they can be used as standard candles to measure cosmic distances. That's because they pulsate at set rates related to their luminosity and temperature, allowing astronomers to use the inverse square law to determine their distance. The first data set from the Triangular Andromeda clouds showed that none of the R. Lyra stars follow the same sequence as the red giants. It also revealed that the galactic disk contains much larger populations of red giants than it does R. R. Lyra stars, and that's the opposite of what we find in smaller galaxies falling into the Milky Way, which typically contain larger populations of R. R. Lyra stars and few, if any, red giants. The researchers realised that these stellar overdensities bulging from the galactic disk were not remnants of other galaxies being destroyed by the Milky Way's gravitational field, but instead they were more likely from the Milky Way itself. The very latest research reported in this new study has further confirmed this emerging picture. The authors found that the composition of several red giants burning in the rings around the Milky Way are composed of a mixture of elements very similar in composition to those found in the galactic disk, and unlike the compositions of stars found around the galactic halo or in other nearby galaxies. One of the study's authors, Dr Luca Casagrande from the Australian National University, says the observations provide compelling evidence that this remote group of stars originated from within our galaxy. Casagrande and colleagues measured the temperature of the stars involved in the study, which enabled the team's analysis of stellar distances and chemical compositions. The authors used a technique known as infrared flux to measure the temperature of the stars. Casagrande speculates these stars were probably evicted through tidal interactions between the Milky Way and a dwarf galaxy. Tidal interactions between galaxies involve the gravitational field of each galaxy distorting the other. Such interactions can dramatically change the form and structure of the galaxy involved. So 
these stars, they were thought to be part of the halo. And what we found uh, with our analysis is that, in fact, they're not halo stars, as we thought before, but they are stars which were part of the disk billions of years ago. And then they kind of got evicted, scatter high and higher and below the, the disk. So now they are in the halo but they're not halo stars. So they got dragged out somehow by some sort of perturbation, and you guys believe that the evidence indicates this could be as a result of tidal interactions with other galaxies? Yes, that's correct, yes. So the chemical fingerprint, uh, which we use to trace back the origins of the stars, indicates that their chemical composition and chemical abundances, they are identical among those two groups of stars, and they clo very closely match uh, the chemical abundances of stars in the disk of the galaxy. Whereas if those stars were to be part of the halo, they would have very different abundance patterns. So that's the indication that, like, chemistry support their origin as from stars in the disk. And uh, how those stars got scattered so high and below the disk, so far away from the disk? Well, the most likely scenario is that there was like a perturbation, some dwarf galaxies most likely, orbiting around the Milky Way, and the gravitational interaction between the orbiting galaxy and the Milky Way, or the tidal forces kind of perturbed the disk, and that led to the evictions of the stars being like scattered away. Are these stars all reasonably close together or are they spread out as a stream or what do they look like? They are reasonably close together on galactic scales, yes. Those stars, they were first identified as over densities. So that's how they got our attention because they were like over dense compared to the average of stars in that location of the halo. By studying the composition of these stars, you're able to work out their family DNA it appears to be similar to that in our Milky Way galaxy. How did you get their composition? Yes, that's correct. To get the composition, we took the spectra of these stars. So taking a spectra, you can think of that as like, well, on a daily basis, for example, if you, you know, if you think of a rainbow and what happens is that the drop of light, they, they split the light of the sun into the colors of the rainbow. Now, if you do that on a much, much higher resolution as we speak, so what you do is that you collect the lights of the star with a telescope and at the end of the telescope, you place a prism that splits the light of those stars and instead of having a rainbow for each of those stars, what you get is a very high resolution rainbow that we call the spectrum of a star. And then by studying the spectrum of the star, in the spectrum we can identify several different lines. And those lines are originating from the atoms and the molecules which are present in the star. And so by studying the intensity of those lines, and we know that certain lines at certain wavelengths, they correspond to certain atomic uh, or molecular rotation or atomic transition and therefore we can like depending on the position of the line we know which element is and depending on the strength of the line in the spectrum then we know the amount of element that is in that star and in that way we were able to trace back or to analyze a number of significant elements and find their composition and effectively yes using their chemical signature as the DNA of those stars to trace back where they're coming from. By using this method can you also work out what their motion across the sky is? Are they sort of rotating with the galaxy or have they been perturbed in such a way that their motion is different to say stars on the disk? We can obtain kinematic information from those spectra simply because the stars are moving in the galaxy and by moving in the galaxy they have a certain velocity with respect to us. What that means is that the spectrum of the star get shifted because of their velocity. And so that's known as a Doppler effect. And so, for example, in the most basic form, you can think, uh, you know, when you hear the, the sound of an ambulance, and if it's approaching to us, the pitch is higher. If it's getting up away from us, the pitch is uh, much lower. And so the same happens with sounds, or in this case, with light. And so because of this Doppler effect, you know, if the stars are moving towards stars or if they're moving away from us, the spectrum gets shifted. And by measuring the amount of shift, then we can infer the velocity at which they are moving away from us or not. That's only like one information, of course, is like the line of sight velocity. But then there is also other information, like the proper motion, so how they're moving in the sky, and combining this information with the, with the radial velocity, then we can decompose and find the, you know, the, 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 the full velocity information of those stars in the galaxy. And by doing that, then uh, we can uh, reconstruct the orbit and uh, use the kinematic and the dynamical information as another completely independent verification of their origin. And what sort of stars are they? Are they just a regular mixture of different spectral dwarfs or, or what? Oh, well, 
Well, those stars, based also on the spectroscopic analysis, we can derive which kind of stars they are based on what we call the surface gravity. And the surface gravity indicates that it is fairly low, so lower than, for example, the Sun. So there are more evolved stars than the Sun based on that. And that also makes sense because those stars are fairly far away and therefore being so far away simply because of observational biases, you are more more likely to see uh, more evolved, uh, brighter stars. So those stars are on the what is called the red giant phase, uh, which is a phase, well, the, the sun will go into the space in uh, several billion years from now, but those stars are in that phase at the moment, and that makes them uh, much brighter than the sun, and that's also why they're easier to see so far away. Mm, we're seeing stellar streams within our own galaxy, which we know involve stars that aren't part of our galaxy. They were part of other galaxies that have already been cannibalized. Yes, that's very true. And in fact, for example, if we look at the again at their climatic information and uh, also to their abundance, there are like a number of stars also like relatively close to us uh, that are fairly bright and have been known for uh, for several years now. And their chemical abundance pattern is in fact typical of the chemical abundance patterns that, for example, we measure in uh, dwarf galaxies. And so in a way, this is very fascinating because we might have like very nearby stars uh, to us that, in fact, they might have an extragalactic origin. Now, these two groups of stars that you guys were looking at, the A13 and the Triangulum Andromeda, tell me about them. So these two groups of stars, they have been known for like some time uh, in the sense that uh, they are placed in these over densities in the sky. And so like that's how first got our attention. But as as I said before, those stars and those other densities, they were thought to be part of the halo. And so what the game-changing thing that we found is that, in fact, they are in the halo, but they're not formed as part of the halo. They were, like, in fact, in the disk of our own galaxy. That's Dr. Luca Casagrande from the Australian National University. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Scientists hoping to find life on a planet in the nearest neighbouring star system to our own solar system have been disappointed following observations of spectacular stellar flare activity on its host star, Proxima Centauri. Located just 4.243 light years away, Proxima Centauri is part of the triple star Alpha Centauri system. The system comprises two primary stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, which orbit each other in a close binary. One of these stars is slightly larger and hotter than the Sun, while the other slightly smaller and cooler. The two stars are in turn orbited by a third star in the system, Proxima Centauri, a small spectral type M red dwarf star. In 2016, astronomers discovered an Earth-sized planet, Proxima b, orbiting in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. Now, that's the so-called Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and not too cold, but just right for a planet to have liquid water pooling on its surface under the right atmospheric conditions. And of course, on Earth, wherever you find liquid water, you find life. However, while loads of people got really excited about the news, others, including yours truly, expressed reservations, pointing out the fact that planets orbiting red dwarf stars aren't good candidates for life, because their host stars tend to be highly unstable, with powerful stellar flares and coronal mass ejections a common occurrence. Now, data from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope in Chile, has observed a powerful stellar flare erupting from Proxima Centauri. The observations reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters raises serious questions about the likely habitability of our solar system's nearest exoplanetary neighbour. At its peak, the newly recognised stellar flare was some 10 times brighter than our Sun's largest solar flares when observed at similar wavelengths. Stellar flares haven't been well studied in the millimetre and submillimetre wavelengths detected by ALMA, especially around red dwarfs like Proxima Centauri, despite the fact that red dwarfs are the most common stars known. The study's lead author, Meredith McGregor from the Carnegie Institute, says the enormous flare event on March 24, 2017, was discovered during a reanalysis of ALMA observations taken last year. The flare increased Proxima Centauri's brightness by more than a thousand times over just 10 seconds. This was preceded by a smaller flare, and taken together, the whole event lasted fewer than two minutes out of the 10 hours that ALMA observed the star between January and March last year. Stellar flares happen when a shift in the star's magnetic field accelerates electrons to speeds approaching that of light. 
The accelerated electrons interact with a highly charged plasma that makes up most of the star, causing eruptions that produce emissions across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. McGregor says it's highly likely Proxima b would have been blasted by high-energy radiation during the flare. Proxima Centauri is already known to experience regular, though smaller, X-ray flares. Over the billions of years since Proxima b formed, flares like this one could have evaporated any atmosphere or ocean and sterilised the planet's surface. And all that suggests that habitability involves much more than just being at the right distance from the host star to have liquid water. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Three Expedition 54 crew members have returned safely to Earth after spending 168 days in space aboard the International Space Station. Their Soyuz MS-06 capsule floated back to Earth below a giant canopy of an orange and white parachute. The dawn touchdown on the cold Kazakhstan steppe was cushioned by the firing of soft landing thrusters just seconds before contact with the ground was made three and a half hours after undocking from the orbiting outpost. Search and recovery helicopters circling the landing zone in preparation for the Soyuz return quickly zoomed in to extract the three crewmen from their charred, blackened capsule. During their time on station, the Expedition 54 crew took numerous spacewalks to carry out crucial maintenance on the robotic Canadarm2 and install new external cameras. They also replaced an electronics box on the Russian's Vesta module's high-gain communications antenna. This day also saw the arrival of one Dragon, one Cygnus and two Progress cargo ships, and they carried out research on some 250 experiments. These included the creation of optical fibre filaments in microgravity, the development of more accurate implantable biosensors, and measuring the sun's energy output to Earth as part of ongoing research into climate change caused by man's use of fossil fuels. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. And a new study has linked problem drinking to early onset dementia. The findings, reported in the journal Lancet Public Health, examined the health records of more than a million adults diagnosed with dementia between 2008 and 2013. It found a clear link between alcohol use disorders and an increased risk of all types of dementia, especially early onset dementia. Researchers found 57,000 cases of early-onset dementia, 39% of which were alcohol-related by definition, while 17.6% had an additional diagnosis of alcohol use disorders. Scientists have developed what they believe could be the first reliable blood and urine test for autism spectrum disorders. The new test, reported in the journal Molecular Autism, searches for damage to proteins that can indicate autism in children. The tests could lead to earlier detection of children with autism, allowing doctors to begin appropriate treatments much earlier in a child's life. Autism spectrum disorders are defined as developmental disorders mainly affecting social interaction, but they can also include a wide spectrum of behavioural problems. These include speech disturbances, repetitive and or compulsive behaviour, hyperactivity, anxiety and difficulty to adapt to new environments, some with or without cognitive impairment. Since there is such a wide range of symptoms, diagnosis can be both difficult and uncertain, especially at the early stages of development. Scientists found a link between autism and damage to proteins in blood plasma by oxidation and glyconation, processes where reactive oxygen species and sugar molecules spontaneously modify proteins. Kids with autism have higher levels of the oxidation marker ditrazine and certain sugar-modified compounds called advanced glycination end products. Genetic causes have been found in 30 to 35 percent of cases of autism, with the remaining 65 to 70 percent of cases thought to be caused by a combination of environmental factors, multiple mutations and rare genetic variants. However, the authors believe their new test could reveal yet to be identified causes. Researchers examined 38 children aged 5 to 12 who have been diagnosed with autism, as well as 31 neurotypical kids to act as controls. They discovered specific biomarkers for mutations of amino acid transporters in the kids with autism. 
A new study warns that many of the world's coral reefs could begin to erode within the next 30 years because of increased ocean acidity being caused by global warming. The findings, reported in the journal Science, claim the sands which provide material for building and maintenance of coral reefs will begin to dissolve due to increased ocean acidity. Global warming is caused by using hydrocarbon fuels such as oil and coal, which release huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This CO2 blanket creates a greenhouse effect which heats up the planet by preventing heat from escaping into space. Scientists mapping the DNA of elephants have confirmed there are actually three rather than two species of the modern pachyderm alive today. While most people can split the trunk carrying behemoths into Indian African elephants, the findings reported in the journal PNAS have confirmed that African elephants are actually two separate species, the African forest elephant and the African savanna or bush elephant. Both African elephant species are about 3.2 metres tall at the shoulder and weigh around 6 to 7 tonnes. Forest elephants have slightly smaller, more rounded ears and thinner, straighter tusks than bush elephants. The genetic evidence shows the two species probably diverged about 6 million years ago. Indian, or more accurately Asian elephants, have far smaller ears and are smaller in overall stature, reaching an average height of 2.8 metres at the shoulder and a weight of around 4 to 5 tonnes. Interestingly, the Asian elephants are more closely related to the now extinct mammoths than what they are to their African cousins. The largest known mammoths reach heights of 4 metres at the shoulder and weighed over 8 tonnes. Samsung has released its latest offerings in the smartphone market. The new Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus offers new cameras, slow-mo video capability, new speakers and even customised emojis that look like you. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahara of Reut, from IT Wire. It's smartphone season. We've got Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. It happens this time every year and there's new Nokias, there's new Huawei, there's new phones from just about everybody. But the flagship one that most people are looking for is the Samsung. And this time we have the Samsung S9 and the S9 Plus. And these visually look very similar to the S8 and S8 Plus from last year. But of course, they have a bunch of new things inside. Such as? Naturally, we have a faster processor. In this case, the Snapdragon 845, which is the fastest ARM-based processor, the processor that's used in most of the Android-based smartphones we have in the market today. And in other markets besides the US, Samsung also makes its own processor called the Exynos, which is equivalent to the Snapdragon 845. But uh, Samsung makes its own processors like Apple and other companies do, and so they like to use their own. Why the difference? Why in the United States do they have to use uh, the Snapdragon? Because of an ancient licensing agreement whereby Qualcomm insisted that Samsung only use its processors in the United States because the United States is the biggest market. But the irony is that According to benchmarks, Samsung's own version of basically the same sort of chip gets higher benchmarks. So it would appear the U.S. is getting the raw end of the deal in other countries where Samsung can use whatever chips it wants. The other big thing that they spoke about with the Samsung S9 was its camera. Yeah, but does more megapixels mean better? No, well, generally more megapixels doesn't necessarily mean better. In this case, we have 12 megapixels. On the back, it's super speed dual pixel camera, 12 megapixels. So squeezing 16 or 20 megapixels into a camera, and there are phones out there that have that. That means that each pixel gets less light because there's so many of them jammed into that tiny little sensor. But they do have optical image stabilization. And in fact, the S9 Plus has dual optical image stabilization and a wide angle sensor and a telephoto, which the, the smaller S9 doesn't. But both cameras do offer super slow-mo. That's where they can have dynamic slow motion video of up to 960 frames per second. Mm. There's also got Bixby inside, will be a newer version of their intelligent assistant, which competes against Google Assistant, which is also available on the phone. You know, you've got two assistants in the one phone and in fact you can download Alexa anything you can't do is have Apple Siri they also have stereo speakers tuned by AKG one of the big speaker brands and that's Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire you're listening to Space Time I'm Stuart Gary and that's the show for now you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes Stitcher Bytes.com Pocket Casts SoundCloud YouTube Audio Boom from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary. 
at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram and on Facebook. Just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.